Excellent. All right, welcome to the Metasploit Sprint demo meeting for December 12, 2017. Uh, looking at some stats here, uh, looking at open features and enhancements by date over the last year. Um, you can see we've it's still retaining kind of flat trajectory there. It's come down a little bit over the, since uh, August. Um, so just moving along. Well, let's look at the open pull requests. So you can see open pull requests is still still hitting above there. Um, it's about as high as it was uh, a few months back in August. Um, that's a good problem to have. So appreciate all those uh, PRs coming in. And speaking of that, for those of y'all keeping score at home, here's the latest leaderboard over the last uh, four weeks or 30 days. Uh, so big thanks to everybody on there. Uh, so let's talk about some things that landed. Uh, we had a community capture the flag, which is not really landing something, but more of a process. Um, James will talk more about that in a minute, I think. Um, we had uh, you know, the, uh, the I am root uh, High Sierra uh, 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 authentication bypass. It got a bunch of uh, news a few weeks ago. Uh, we had a module landed, uh, thanks to Tim WR for that. Uh, we have some remote code execution exploit modules, uh, one targeting uh, Polycom HDX, uh, conferencing device. Uh, another that, oh, there's a typo there, Microsoft Office OLE parsing uh, memory corruption. Uh, Dupe Scout Enterprise uh, application and an Advantech uh, web access. We've got new modules for all of those. You can clone the latest uh, framework and play with. Um, we also had a, a support for, in the Windows interpreter for Unicode usernames and uh, domain hash dump uh, support for uh, Windows uh, 2016 domain controllers, and in some cases, support for that means printing out a nice error message, uh, but, but gracefully handling it. Um, we also had some Android advanced options uh, added, including uh, things like um, enabling debug and um, enabling the wake lock, uh, so it's very cool. And we've had some usability improvements, uh, tab completion, um, a, more of a, a path uh, context of a module you're using, so it's, it makes more sense of where you are exactly in the in the tree uh, when you're at a, using an SF console. Um, Brent, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, let's see, no, not not too much. I think you pretty much covered what what landed. That's good. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. And things in the works. Uh, we've got a lot in the works. Um, a couple of scanner modules um, in the PRQ right now. One for a vulnerable ASIS uh, uh, service that runs on some of their uh, router devices. And uh, another one for uh, web services dynamic discovery. Um, also some remote code execution uh, exploit modules. Um, Disk Boss is, is a new one um, since the last meeting we had. And, and the rest of the list, a lot of those are ones we, we touched on last time. Um, Brent, did you have anything you wanted to add about stuff that's in the works? Uh, well, uh, we might have some interesting demos that will show some other cool stuff that's in the works as well. So uh, I don't want to spoil any thunder to start with. <laughs> um, so Fair enough. We'll, we'll wait a second. Cool. All right. So stay tuned. Awesome. And with that, let's go into some of the team updates. Dharma Initiative. Namaste. Uh, Namaste. Yep. We helped with the uh, successful CTF, or at least Wei did. Um, that was pretty great. Congrats to all the winners. Uh, I think uh, James is going to talk about that some more, so I won't uh, linger on it too much. Uh, we were battling some uh, sickness this sprint, so we didn't get a whole lot done. But we have started uh, the sort of research initiatives that we think we're going to carry through through the next year. Um, and one of them is potentially integrating with Rapid7's uh, Project Sonar and getting the same uh, scanners that they use to scan the internet available inside a framework for anyone to scan uh, their own enterprise or uh, on a pen test to scan for a particular kind of open proxy or uh, what have you. Some, they're all a bit less intrusive because uh, they're the, what we use to scan the whole internet, uh, but they can point out some really interesting stuff. Oh, that sounds cool. Thanks, Adam. All right, script kiddies. What y'all been up to? Uh, I guess I'll throw it. Um, hey, Brandon. Hello. Uh, so we've been working on configuring some internal stuff to do better testing so that we'll actually know when stuff is broken before people tell us it's broken. Uh, we're also working on some items for the terminal in uh, Metasploit. Uh, doing some changes to baseline builder to give a little bit easier use of 
uh, baseline builder for larger test cases, as well as expanding the coverage. Uh, and uh, we just recently landed a couple of changes to Meterpreter. I don't know if Brent would like to talk about the, the Meterpreter changes. Oh, sure. I could talk about them just a little bit. I'm, I'm still going to talk a little bit from the demo point of view. Um, but uh, as far as uh, maybe bigger changes that we have in flight for Meterpreter are um, we're making some changes to how uh, – sorry, I'm drawing a little bit of a blank here. <laughs> it's been a long week, and it's only Tuesday. Um, but as far as uh, Meterpreter changes that landed, um, we uh, have a fix for Python Meterpreter, where if it couldn't connect back to a particular URL, um, it would actually spin and use 100% CPU, uh, which wasn't a great experience. Um, now it actually does a progressive fallback if, the, um, if uh, it can't actually reach a target host. Um, some other issues, a community member actually did a, a triage of a Windows Meterpreter and found a few memory leaks. And so he fixed those, um, thanks to uh, this view. Uh, I'm sorry, Vesuve, for, um, for fixing some of those things. Um, something else that's um, kind of in the works that's it's interesting from a uh, interpreter point of view is uh, we had a user from the internet um, email us and say he had trouble getting the PowerShell extension to work in um, Windows 7 by default. And the problem was that we had support for .NET 4 and .NET 2, but we didn't have support for .NET 3. So uh, that's what Windows 7 comes with. So now we have at least a, a correct fallback that goes back to .NET 2 um, for Windows 7. And some other cool stuff, actually, that's, that's coming out soon as well. Um, Simpervic just put up a PR recently to convert all of our packet capture for Windows to use libpcap just like Metal does. So um, that'll be a kind of a neat, neat change so that you don't have to have that proprietary um, code base that's only Rapid7 to build the sniffer extension. So that'll be a nice change moving forward. Yeah, that's good stuff. Thanks, guys. Well, let's see. Abnormal form. What y'all been up to? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, James, go ahead. All right, cool. Um, so I've mostly been working on the uh, Metasploitable CTF that we <laughs> posted last week. Um, it, it was it was a lot of work, but it was uh, pretty successful in my opinion. Um, we had uh, a limit of 500 uh, teams that could register because of AWS constraints. We didn't want to spend all the money on this, so. Um, we uh, limited it to 500. We hit that limit within 36 hours of opening up registration. Um, most of those people came back and played, which is a really good sign too. They didn't just sign up and hold an account. Um, and you know, we had uh, our winners decided pretty quickly, but uh, we had uh, really good participation all the way throughout. Uh, a lot of people just wanted to, you know, see if they could get all the shells and, and get all the flags. Um, I do want to say congratulations to our winners. Uh, first place was a team, uh, Rot26. Um, second place was M Mubix, who I'm sure a lot of you know. And then third place was a Snato team. So Mubix uh, was the only um, solo flyer in, uh, uh, in the top three, which is pretty impressive. Um, the Just to give a little bit more information, the, the um, Joker flag was the one that gave everybody a little bit of trouble. That one that had a... A little bit of a trick to it that um, seemed really difficult at first, and then uh, once you realize what it was, it's kind of face palm, and um, and you feel bad about yourself, but you get the points anyway. Um, outside of the CTF, uh, we've been um, starting working on planning what we're going to do with session handling in Goliath. Um, that's going to take uh, it, it needs quite a bit of changes and upgrades to to make everything work uh, with the collaborative plans that we have and. Um, we're, we're going to, we started doing some discussion last week, and this week we're going to get a little bit more into the meat of it and, and try to get that planned out so we can start tackling it uh, at the beginning of the year. That's it. Awesome. Thanks, James. Good stuff. Flatlanders, uh, we've been plugging along on a lot of, a lot of what we've been plugging along on. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Ruby SMB, uh, DC RPC uh, code is in review. And integration of framework, SMB2 support. Uh, I think we're going to have a little demo of some of that. Uh, metal extension loader, uh, payload improvements have been landed and are in the, uh, the payload uh, repo. Uh, framework improvements have been made and are up in the PR for review. Um, looking at um, forwarding over the, uh, and the, of course the name escapes me now, but the, the key log, Swift keylogger uh, for Mac OS um, uh, code is a metal extension. So good stuff. There we go. 
you know, so this is actually a club here in Austin for live music. Anyway, I'm struggling to find demos graphics if y'all haven't noticed. So uh, in Ruby SMB not too long ago, we got um, file read write um, uh, all the all the basic uh, file operations uh, into the library, and uh, for both SMB two and SMB one. So uh, with that, we can write to named pipes. So uh, you can pretty much do most most of the um, Windows calls, like uh, calling to server service to do net share, new mall, um, et cetera. So I went ahead and uh, replaced the uh, SMB client uh, in the SMB client mixin in Metasploit framework which uh, is used uh, in, in a lot of places. Um, it's, it's used uh, uh, as like the core SMB um, uh, mixin. Um, so uh, I made some minor changes, but uh, it, it, it was pretty seamless. Uh, so I'm gonna demo, what I'm, I'm gonna demo um, uh, enum shares, enum users, and PS exec. This is in progress, so um, I might have to uh, rerun the command uh, a couple of times. Uh, but okay, so I have I have a Windows a Windows uh, host that I have disabled SMB one on. So to show you that, I'm going to use the the module our module for. Uh, checking uh, SMB version. Um, so you can see uh, the SMB one. I didn't get any. I didn't get anything uh, with that. But on SMB two, I got uh, got. Uh, I like two five five dot two, and so. Uh, here is enum users. We got our administrator, Demohanty, and guest. Um, and I will um, do the enum shares. I got my share that I made here. And PS exec. Oh, on SMB two. And uh, a lot of testing and error handling has to be done, but uh, there, there it is. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool, Dad. Thank you, Mike. All right, we've got some more demos to get through, so if you have questions, you know where to find that. <laughs> uh, go. Or, or no? One more. How about Matthew? You on Matthew? You want to go? Sure. Awesome. I can go. Thanks, man. Do it. All right. Um, so what I'm going to demo is I landed a PR from Mr. Me. It's uh, Advantech Web Access. It's um, some sort of SCADA software um, running on Windows. His exploit that he made uh, exploits a stack buffer overflow to gain remote code execution. And this is via uh, specially crafted uh, DCE slash RPC, which is like a um, distributed computing environment remote procedure calls um, protocol. So let me get my screen shared. And we load 
the uh, Advantech Web Access exploit module. We configured it with the appropriate R host and L host for the uh, current system that I'm on. Uh, R host is running in a Windows 7 x86 VM uh, with the Advantech Web Access software installed on it. And we will try to exploit it. Hey, and it works. We have an interpreter session. Very nice. That's awesome. Cool. Thanks, Matthew. Mm -hmm. uh, Brent, you want to take the reins? Sure. Uh, let's see. I'm going to click the button. Let's see here. Yeah. Your entire screen. Why not? Um, so I had a little bit of a demo god problem this morning as well. I'm trying to get my phone to talk over USB-C um, to my laptop. And I wasn't successful in getting that to happen. But I can show you the new options. This is uh, some cool work from Tim Wright. And uh, let me go ahead and actually click the button. There we go. Share. <clears throat> All right. So um, whenever you're using Android Interpreter, um, oftentimes when you're first starting out, you want it to show up as a regular app. You want it to show debug logs. You want all kinds of bells and whistles because you're just debugging it. You want to make sure you know how to inject an app properly into an Android um, you know, APK, or you want to figure out how do I actually run this? How does it work? Um, but when you get to actually using it in, let's call it production mode, um, you might want to be a little bit more stealthy. Um, also, when you run a, an embedded payload on, uh, like, say, an Android device, oftentimes it will go to sleep, wake up, you might be trying to interact with your session, but the user might, uh, who actually has the phone or the target device, might actually you know, be putting it to sleep or uh, shutting it down, or it might just automatically shut down. That's kind of a, a fact of life with Android devices. Let me show you a few, few new options that are really helpful, both for debug purposes and for um, actually maintaining that stealthiness and the persistence that you might want out of an Android payload. Um, these are all advanced options, so I'll show you what they look like. Right now, I actually have the Android Metroper Reverse TCP payload selected within Metasploit. Um, the first option I like to point out is this one up here called Android Hide App Icon. Um, what this basically does is when it installs um, Android Metroper as an application, it makes sure that um, if you turn this on, it will actually not add an application to the launcher. Um, and instead, it will run as a background service that I'm going to get started on reboot and I'm going to get started any time that the system uh, transitions from sleep to wake. Uh, so a pretty nice thing. It, it basically makes it very stealthy. Uh, we used to have this as a default, uh, but a lot of people got confused because when they would then install Android Interpreter, they'd be like, hey, how do I know it's installed? I, I don't see anything, and because that's kind of the point. Now it's actually just an optional parameter that you can set, which is very helpful for, uh, you know, both for debug and for OPSEC. Uh, another... Uh, item that got added is Android Interpreter Debug. This also used to be on by default. And what that basically meant is that uh, anytime you ran Android Interpreter, it would it would log very loudly that, hey, this is org.metasploit.android.meterpreter <laughs> running on your device. If you use Logcat, you'd be ADB or something like that, you'd be able to see all the outputs. Now you can actually turn that off, which is uh, pretty helpful. Again, pretty handy for, for evading. Uh, yes, there is Android AV these days and evading uh, basically kind of detection. Uh, the final piece that was added, this is kind of a neat thing. Um, we, for a long time, we've had the ability to turn on and off the wake lock, which basically a wake lock allows any Android app to tell the phone, please don't, don't go to sleep. Um, with this new Android wake lock parameter, you can basically turn on wake lock by default when Android Interpreter starts. What that means is that if someone you know, actually you know, either gets exploited or installs your vulnerable application, then uh, by default, the phone won't go to sleep until you tell it to go to sleep. So if you get that incoming session coming in, you want to do some interaction, whatever, um, it's not going to go to sleep on you in the in the meantime, or, or you're not going to have to go and jump in with an auto-run script or something like that to, to turn on the wake clock um, manually. Now you can actually set that as a default parameter in your payload, and uh, you'll get a stable connection, or at least as stable as a connection through a mobile network can be. And that's basically uh, the extent of the, the three new uh, Android interpreter commands. Um, like I said, I don't have a, exactly a demo because I can't seem to get a USB connection to my phone to control it, but uh, uh, definitely check it out. It, these are really useful options. And that's all I got. Awesome. Thanks, Brent. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Brendan, you want to you take the reins, sir? And then uh, Jeffrey? 
Yeah, I was going to say, I think Jeffrey's okay. that. I think Jeffrey's what? I believe Jeffrey was going to talk about testing. Oh, OK, cool. Yeah, I can. Uh... I could take a fellow work. I was gonna, I was gonna wait. Brendan was gonna do something, so I thought I'd do, wait at, do after that. But this is fine. Um, let me yeah, man, no set up my. There's the thing I want to share. That's the thing I want to share. Okay, so uh, what, what I'm going to show here, really, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to fully demo it because it takes a while to run. Um, but uh, what we've got here is we've added uh, a new GitHub hook um, into all, all tests that actually, or all PRs that get, pull, get it sent in that will actually run uh, uh, the Metasploit automation that Brendan's been working on for quite some time now. Um, what I've done here is I've put up a couple of initial tests, um, one that runs the SMB login scanner. Um, against uh, two systems and verifies that it still works against Windows 2008 R2 and Windows 2012 X64. Um, this will be expanded. We can add we can add more targets to the list as we go. But just putting in an initial baseline test that we can run to verify this is showing that the payload testing stuff that we've been working on can actually be used for testing modules, not just payloads. Um, this is actually testing the scanner module and Below that, I've got something that's actually testing the Eternal Blue module against Windows 7 x64. Um, this is running. You can see which payload it's going to execute. It's going to execute the Meterpa reverse TCP. And then we've got our command list for items that actually have to be run on the, uh, as an RC script and our, result, our verification for success. Um, what this turns into um, is we have a new job in our Jenkins environment. Um, we call GitHub payload testing automation that actually runs a job for every PR once it gets added. Um, right now, when we run a PR that has uh, that, that's not adding anything new in terms of tests, um, it's just going to verify there's no new tests and let it pass. But if there are new tests, then it'll run through and it'll give us results that look like what happened with uh, test 17 here. We've got a meg of results. This goes back to my PR. Oh, jeez. Oh, hot corners are fun. Um, uh, but if we go actually and look at the results from test 17, we actually get the build artifacts that came out of the test. Um, and those are being kept. And we can go back and actually, the plan is to add uh, another hook to the end of the test to have it push these back, uh, at least the HTML reports back, as comments on the, on the, on the uh, PR itself. That shows us that we actually ran the test. It passed all this. It, it passes status. Um, what targets it ran against. What exploits it ran. What payloads it ran. Um, and they took away my back button, so I have to remember what the other key is for that. Um, and then we can also see the full report log that shows us turning on the VMs, running the tests, and our final succeed um, in that test. And it's going to dip to me again. So we see that was for the SMB login. Um, or Eternal Blue is what I brought up before. Here's the SMB test as it ran. Each each test is run individually. Each test is going to run, uh, going to bring up the targets, bring them down, run on a specific host. It's running. These are internal lab systems that do not have uh, access to anything except for the internet um, at the moment. And these targets. Uh, um, will not have access even to the internet um, shortly. So that gets uh, that's about what we've got for that in terms of showing the new testing functionality. Um, we've got some uh, some some more work coming down the pipe. We're actually adding uh, we're actually adding tests that will run against all of the payloads. Uh, hopefully this week we'll have that running from an internal perspective um, and see what we can do about adding results coming back from uh, either payload PRs or uh, more likely from framework PRs that include a bump to the payload gem uh, to get our results going. Nice. Cool. That was like good stuff. Thank you for that, Jeffrey. Excellent.